And so as science evolves, ethics evolves, and they need to co-evolve and be uh, sort of, I'd say, uh, friends rather than enemies to each other. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Scott Berry, uh, who's done a lot of work on adaptive platform designs. And then after that, we've got uh, Srinivas Murthy, uh, who's going to talk about his experiences with another adaptive platform. So please uh, join me in uh, applauding and uh, welcoming them. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ross. Uh, and, and oh, do I have slides? Okay. And and thanks for Joe Millam for looking over my slides as well. Uh, though I, I do want to complain to the organizing committee that they were quite mean to you. Uh, it's bad enough you invited a statistician, but you ask him to talk on day one after lunch, uh, as though everybody needs their nap time. So uh, a good time for a statistician to talk. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, response adaptive randomization within an Ebola trial and talk about a new kind of trial. So don't immediately think, oh, I know what a platform looks like. I'll try to explain it to you. And, and as Ross said, I'm not an expert in ethics, so I'm going to bring a trial designed to you, and I'm going to tee up questions and would love feedback. And, and of course, in the design of this, ethics was talked about quite a bit. Uh, went into the, the, the design of the trial. So we're used to trials, when I talk about a one-to-one -one trial, we're used to a trial where we're really interested in a single question. Does treatment one work in this disease? We compare it to a control and we say treatment one works in this disease. We might do one-to-one -one randomization for a fixed number of patients and we look at the data when the trial's over. So this platform trial is a very different machine uh, it's one where within a single platform trial, within a single master protocol, we're going to investigate multiple therapies. Rather than trial one looking at drug one against control, trial two looking at drug two against control, we're going to put them all together and investigate them simultaneously. We'll look at M trials at the same time in the same trial. We'll randomize across them. Now, we can ask many more questions. We're interested, does drug one work? Does treatment one? Does treatment two work? Does treatment N work? Is treatment two better than treatment one in the setting? This is now referred to as a disease-specific trial. I'm not running a trial to figure out if drug one is safe and effective. I'm running a trial to figure out the best way to treat this disease. And I'm agnostic to what wins. Now, <clears throat> this is different than uh, running a consortium where the consortium runs a protocol one and a protocol two and a patient comes in and says, I want to be in protocol one. This is a trial where the patient enters into the protocol and the protocol assigns them a treatment. There's one protocol with multiple arms in the protocol. It's written in a modular fashion, so the protocol exists with no drug names in it. It describes what happens to the patients, what are the endpoints, what are the visit schedules. How do we randomize them to agents that are there, but it doesn't say what they are because they're plug and play as appendices to the master protocol? It may be that as the trial evolves, treatment one leaves. We find out it's not effective. It leaves the trial, and now we're randomizing to two and three. And then in the middle of the trial, we had treatment four. And this is the exact same protocol, and it evolves as we go, potentially uh, as long as the need exists for the treatment of that disease. Hence the name Master Protocol. So this uh, EV003 is an adaptive platform trial. It was funded by the Gates Foundation. Uh, and, and you saw a number of the collaborators involved in this. Um, it, it was reviewed and approved by the Duke University IRB as well as the Sierra Leone Ethics Committee. I will say before I get on that this never enrolled a single patient. It was one of these trials that was created, it was set up, and by the time it was ready to enroll, we had the CRO, all the structure, all the logistics in place to run the trial. There, was, there weren't patients to be had in the setting. The, the master protocol dictates what happens, and immediately this trial did a couple things. It was going to response adaptive randomize to the agents. If one agent was working better than another one, we would put more patients on that right away. We did interims weekly during the course of the trial to update randomizations. We would favor arms that were doing better, but we also immediately combined together two agents. 
rather than run a trial, say, wow, drug one's kind of nice, drug seven's kind of nice, let's put them together 12 years down the road, immediately we combine them together. So we might randomize somebody to drug one and two within the protocol, as long as it was deemed okay to add them together. The endpoint in the trial was 14-day mortality. So this was the treatment of subjects with Ebola. It, the, the, the protocol was built to be flexible, to have different number of agents within the trial, maybe start with two, add a third, add a fourth, drop an arm, and continue on. The trial was entirely prospectively built. It's now a machine that has algorithms, and I'll skip the various details of it. It is run by a Bayesian algorithm that assigns the relative likelihood of each treatment being the best way to treat Ebola. And that could be a, com a, a regimen or it could be a single agent. And that probability is used as the randomization probability during the next week in the trial. And then next week we update it again and then we update it again during the course of the trial. And it's all prospective. Two different groups taking the rules of the trial would run exactly the same trial. This isn't that we give the data to a group and they decide what to do. It's a prospective Bayesian algorithm that runs the trial. It's watched, but it's, it's a way, it's an automatic pilot. So I'll so, show you an example of a simulated trial where there are four agents in the trial, uh, and they can be given individually or they can be given in combination. So we could give one and three, that's one of the yellow boxes. We could give one by itself, that's one of the green boxes. So there's four individual arms and six combined arms that can be given. There's ten arms in the trial as soon as it starts. So what I'll show you is a movie of the trial progression. The far right is the Bayesian algorithm, and I won't say much about that, but it's the relative probability that that arm is the best. The, if you, can, you may not be able to see the numbers, but there's one by itself, one with two, one with three, one with four, two by itself, and so on, the ten different arms. On the left are going to be the data that comes in during the week. That's the new, fresh data that goes to the algorithm. In the middle will be the combined data, where red represents mortality and gray represents survival. So the trial starts off even randomization, and then I'll click forward a little bit. Now we get to the point where we're starting to get mortality. We've done eight interim analyses during the course of the trial, and we have relative probabilities that the different arms are the best in the trial. So at this point on the far right, arm four and arm three are looking the best, and actually three plus four together is looking even better than either one of them individually. So now we're randomizing many patients to those arms, and we've almost given up on one and two at this point. We're still giving them, we're still randomizing, and you can see we've given one plus four and three plus four and four the most. The trial continues on, flipping through with interims being done weekly, randomizations being updated, and I'll move this to 250 now. And I'll show you the final data. So at two, I, I shouldn't say final data. This is we stopped it at 250. It's a perpetual trial. Uh, but at 250, these are the number of patients that have been randomized to the 10 different arms. And you can see at this point about 100 patients have been randomized to the 3 plus 4 arms with an overall 6% mortality. You can compare that to 1 plus 3 is 36% mortality, 1 plus 4 was 19% mortality. It assigned the better arms more often and it really decided 3 plus 4 looked the best. Uh, I'll skip the Bayesian algorithm. Essentially this is the posterior probability estimates for the mortality within each of the arms. This is an interesting graph. This shows the 10 different randomization probabilities during the course of this 250 patient trial. Uh, they're color coded by the, one, the, the, the colors of each of them. Notice the randomization probability for the 3 plus 4 arm. It starts off equally likely over here to the left, and it slowly, as we learn more and more that that looks like the best arm, increased in probability. By the end, it was being given to 80% of patients during the course of the trial with a mix of other arms. The yellow uh, uh, line here is not a randomization probability. What it is is it's the probability that a subject entering the trial would, would die, the negative outcome would be a mortality, 
only based on the allocation of the randomization of the arms. This isn't a drift in the patient population. This is the fact that we're giving better arms as we learn which are more effective. Equally likely randomization at a 28% mortality rate. By the time we're doing response adaptive randomization during the course of the trial, it dropped to about 12 or 13% because we identified which combinations and which arms are working better. And at any point here, I didn't show this, but we could add an arm in the course of the trial. So, wow, this is really, ZMAP is now available. Let's put it in the trial and see how it does with the other arms. So what are the ramifications of this? That was, a, that was one example trial to, through 250 patients. We did 10,000 of those, and we took at the, looked at the average behavior of this trial design. And so you can see in the 10 different slots, we have different characteristics of the trial. And this is comparing the operating characteristics of the different, uh, of in the, within the different arms. The, the number of red and green circles and the number of circles are the average number of patients placed on that arm. So on average, 89.6% 89.6 patients were allocated to the three plus four arm. I forgot to say. The blue value in there is the truth about the mortality rate. So I simulate, I get to play the role of Mother Nature and give a probability of mortality in every cell. And it was 0.1. A 10% mortality rate is a truth if you give 3 plus 4. If you give 1 by itself, it's 40%. If you give 1 and 2 together, it's 40%. Neither one of them work uh, in the setting. 0 0.3, 0 0.3, so three kind of works, and four really works, and four plus three works the best. On average, 89 patients were given to the three plus four relative to eight patients to uh, one plus two in the course of 250 patients. The probability of identifying the right arm using this is 89.1%. Uh, this is the number in the bottom of the cell. If I did fixed randomization, it would be 81%. So I can cut in half the probability of not identifying that as the right one. So I have more precision because I can identify those that look good, put more and more patients on those arms, I'm more likely to find the right answer. In the bottom right, I compared adaptive randomization in this platform trial to fixed randomization, and the average number of deaths through 250 patients is 69.9 if I did fixed to 49.4 if I do adaptive randomization. So I'm more likely to get the right answer, and I treat patients in the trial better than if I did fixed randomization. Now, there are a great deal of other uh, uh, added benefits to this. We interacted with the agency. The agency loves the trial. Janet Woodcock wrote a paper in July in the New England Journal of Medicine about master protocols. They asked us to run a couple different circumstances, and I'll show you one of these. If we were to put three agents in this trial and we didn't allow them to be given to, together. They were comparing to some other trial designs, the NIH Prevail trial, for example, and they were interested in how this would behave with three arms and you can't give combinations, so they restricted. Otherwise, it was exact same trial design. If we put them in and allowed 250 patients and there's one agent that has a 15% mortality rate and all the others are 40%, this trial has a 97% chance at demonstrating that arm is better than the standard of care. If we did three separate trials, those are the three red boxes there, and they get to split the 250 patients, so we do separate inferences, separate trials, and we split the patients, I only have a 71% chance of identifying that arm as being better than standard of care. All of them in the same king of the hill trial, what works best, has a 97% chance of identifying because I can focus on the arm where it's only 71% if I do them separately. So it's much stronger in that. Now, the interesting thing is the trial forsakes arms that are not as effective. So if one of them has a 10% mortality and the other one 20, we're much more likely to find the 10. We're actually less likely to find the 20 because we don't care about it anymore. It's second best. 
That's an aspect of this king of the hill randomization. It's an aspect of this trial design. Now, one of the huge benefits we had is we would actually be already putting these two arms together in the same trial much faster than our standard approach of doing siloed uh, drug investigation. Okay, uh, the, I, I forgot to say this as well, as the trial design was built it, within the construct of do we have a standard of care in this setting? Is it ethical to have a standard of care? So we built the trial that we might have one, we might not. If there's a standard of care, 20% of patients were randomized to standard of care. If not, they're all randomized to investigational agents. If during the course of the trial, an arm had a 95% probability of being better than standard of care, we remove standard of care. So this was partly the ethical aspect of standard of care. Once we know something's better than standard of care, it's gone. Uh, and once we know an arm is not as good as other arms, it leaves the trial. Which, so the, the, the ethical ramifications of this in a pandemic setting, there's a huge aspect of this, and we, we, it was a failure of the last one. We didn't really learn how to treat Ebola. And now we put everything together into the same arena. We've got a much better chance of figuring out what works. We're much faster within it. And now the ethical aspects of this. It deals with the standard of care because as soon as we know it's not there anymore, we remove it. We, as soon as we know it's inferior to something else. The response adaptive randomization, weekly we're giving the arms that appear to be better during the course of the trial. We're treating patients in the trial better. Um, it also, we, we never address type 3 errors when we talk about trials, type 1, type 2. Type 3 is the fact that we never investigated a particular agent. We spent all this time on these arms and we never investigated agent 3, 4, and 5. Now we've got the ability to get them much faster, enter them into the trial much faster. You now have to ask the question, in a pandemic setting, is it ethical to run one-to-one -one trials, forsaking the resources to learn more effectively in, in more complicated trial designs. The, the other trade-offs of this is if you have a master protocol running, as soon as drug seven becomes interesting, you can be first patient in in a week or two. You just have to approve it within the trial, but the trial is already running. If I want to investigate drug seven in a separate trial, I need to go file my IRBs. I need to create the protocol. We're talking months, if not years, to do that. But if I have a master protocol drug-specific trial running, it can be done really quite quickly. So the speed of first patient in relative to this question of what works within this pandemic disease, I think the trade-off of this, the ethical trade-off of this is quite nice. So I will stop there. Thanks, Ross. So we have time for a couple of questions. Yes, one, two, three. So, yep. Gentlemen, there in the middle, then over to the right, and then to the back to Carla. It's nice to see people racing to you with a microphone, <laughs> huh? <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you. That's really interesting. I, so I'm curious, with the weekly interim analyses, and since you're now in a Bayesian framework, what threshold level of evidence do you need for licensure? Because in traditional trial designs, there's this clear cutoff that is predefined, whereas here, everything's a little more amorphous. So do you run the risk of saying, hey, we think we found the best combination of therapies, but we're actually not really sure that they work? And, and yeah, how do you stop the trial when you're doing this? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. It's actually what we, we talked about with the agency. The trial was never designed for licensure, but in order to attract sponsors into the trial, we want that to be an outlet, a potential outlet, so hence visiting with the FDA. So we did simulations with the FDA, and you can adjust that Bayesian posterior probability, even doing 10, 20 interims, so that the type 1 error for a particular drug is controlled, and that, that was our discussion with the agency. The, and so we ended up with a 99.2% probability in that trial for determining superiority of an agent relative to control had a, an adequate control of type 1 error from the agency's perspective. One of the other really nice things related to this is that as soon as one of the arms demonstrated superiority to standard of care, we announced that to the world. Uh, even though that's now being used in the trial and it may actually become standard of care within the trial, we can announce it immediately because of the weekly interim analyses. There's a question up here. And then, oh, Carla, you're third. So I, I saw your hand. Okay, three questions and then we need to the next. Oh, well, four. 
Uh, how many submissions do you have to the ethics committee? Do you only have one protocol that you submit at the beginning and then you tell them these are the changes that you're going to adopt later or every time you amend, because the current practice is every time you amend, you need ethics committee approval. What's nice is, so the weekly updates to randomization is not an amendment to the protocol. We said this is what we're going to do. All we do is enact it. Much like we stratify randomization, you don't tell an IRB that we hit the end of our randomized block and now we're doing another one. What we, we will go back when we add an arm. They, they approve the protocol without any drugs listed. And then when we say, aha, we've got a drug, we're putting it in, do you approve the drug because they've already approved the protocol? Now drug two comes in, do you approve this drug being added to it? They can review the drug and the procedures around that, any specific exclusion criteria, because they've already approved the protocol. So every time a drug is added, yes, we go to IRBs. So what, what would you consider as an amendment? The change in the drug? Uh, adding a drug. Uh, it's, it's, in a weird way, it's not an amendment. It was designed to do it, but we, we let them know of that. If we change the written rules of the trial in some way, that becomes an amendment. This is an evolving design by design. Evolutions of it are the trial design. There we go. So discussions about, about uh, adaptive uh, uh, platforms are us usually prefaced by uh, uh, a discussion about why uh, we need to look into this novel trial. So uh, because of ethical challenges, feasibility challenges, or uh, acceptability challenges. And I like that you made like this sort of fresh presentation without starting there. So I would just, for clarification, I want to know, so is, is your claim that in the absence of those considerations about ethics, feasibility, or uh, acceptability, from, strictly from a scientific perspective, an adaptive trial design is, uh, is uh, scientifically uh, superior to yield the answer to the question, the research question more efficiently? Yeah, so it's, it, yeah, absolutely. A, a, a fixed design is a subset of adaptive designs. You're going to find one more fact. In this case, there's many adaptive things being done. The ability to decide something superior weakly. But the changing in randomization probably is when you have more than two arms. If you have two arms, one to one is the best. Uh, but if you have more than two arms, you increase the inference ability, the power, the strength of the trial by doing adaptations. This isn't an ethical thing that we're asking people to suffer by doing the adaptive things, which obviously brings up the ethical question is one-to-one -one ethical with more than two arms. It's less effective. You're actually asking patients to suffer if in one-to-one, -one, so it is inferentially stronger, yes. Uh, I have a question for clarification. So interesting. First time I hear and understand so much about it. Um, my question is about the threshold at which you decide that um, a specific arm should be taken out of the consideration. Do you consider it a minimum? Because especially in a disease where there's lots of variation, I can imagine that you want to avoid the risk of a chance um, removal of an arm just because it happens that a few patients um, respond very poorly. Yeah, we, so we do have a futility that an arm gets removed if it dropped below a certain percent. What we do is we simulate these trials. So we build simulation of the trial design and we simulate our many circumstances to make sure we don't inappropriately drop it out. So we ended up with a 1% probability. If the probably it's in the maximum way to treat a patient drops below 1%, we remove it. And that had really good operating characteristics. But you don't have an absolute number threshold. For example, in the example of the modeling, you had six in one arm that was dropped out. Whereas from a clinical perspective, I can imagine that six is a number that actually accounts, doesn't account yeah. for clinical variation. No, we did not have a minimum. By the way, there were six in one and two. But one was also given by itself, one was given with three, one was given with four. So it wasn't adding to anything. Yeah. There were more than six before we gave up on one. Okay. That was one cell. Yeah. 